The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to be designing a PIC32 based development board. I use the PIC32 for a variety of projects, both on the show and outside the show, so I figured it would be a good candidate for my own custom board. Let's look at the parts. There's a PIC32 microcontroller. This particular one runs at 40 megahertz and has 128K flash, 32K RAM, so it's quite a bit beefier than your average Arduino. There'll be two buttons, program and reset, a crystal, a program header so you can actually put the bootloader onto the chip when you first initialize it. Once the bootloader is there, you'll be able to use a USB port for all the normal programming. And there'll be two headers that will basically just pin out everything from the chip so you can hook it up to external devices. We're going to start this project by taking an existing design that I have in Eagle that uses the chip and break it down so we can make a new board with it. Let's get started. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. As some of you may or may not know or care, I do a lot of work with the video game industry on latency. So when you're playing a game and you push a button and the character fires their weapon with good response time, I'm partially to thank for that. Anyway, um, this design here on the screen is a latency monitor for Xbox One that I designed a couple years ago. And it uses the same PIC32 microcontroller that we're going to be using in today's episode. So since I know this layout already works, it is a great basis for this new dev board. I'm going through the uh, schematic and doing group deletes on everything that we don't actually need. And that will leave us with the bare essentials for a microcontroller dev board. So all this board specific stuff, we can go bye bye. Let's see what's left. All right, got the microcontroller here, the regulator, USB plug, the uh, programming plug, reset and program button and the uh, crystal. There's our base system. Let's take a look at the board view. Oh look, almost everything is gone. So we can do a uh, rip up command. I'll type rip up, uh, semicolon. Yes, okay, that rips up all the signals and just leaves us with the bare components. I do, however, want to uh, make a new board. So I'm gonna try a hack. I'm gonna go into the folder Erase the board file. And now click on the board button, which should create a new board from scratch without the baggage of the old board. There we go, look at that. So we basically just kept the schematic and uh, redid the board. So this outer white line is the dimension. This is the outside of your uh, PCB. I'm gonna shrink it down quite a bit because we wanna make this as small as possible because the smaller it is, the cheaper it is. I always say that first, don't I? And the better it will fit into other projects. So some of these ob objects here, you really can't make any smaller like the uh, USB port. And for whatever reason, I'm against micro USB, so I, I want my mini USB. Let's just do it basically out here. So microcontroller there. This is your six pin programming header that you'll use a uh, pick kit three to a flash. Again, just for the initial uh, bootloader. Once you have that in place, you don't need the picket anymore. I think the regulator will go on the back, so I'm going to uh, mirror it, which it's not, that's kind of a weird, uh, weird thing to say because it's putting it on the back. See how the uh, pads change to purple? That means it's the uh, rear layer. I think I'll also put the crystal on the back as well, right behind the microcontroller. So the crystal and the caps that go with it. All right, the rest of the stuff I think will be the top layer. These tack switches are too big. I'm going to replace them with smaller tack switches. So I'm just gonna put these in place right there, right there. Make sure that they're actually connected. Looks like they are. Go back to the board view. Ah, oh, there they are. Ah, these switches are much smaller. Kind of thinking the switches will go 
on either side of the USB connector, like that. Well, before I get too much further, we should add some headers. That'll work. So I'm gonna add two of these. One, two, and they will go on either side. Put one there, put one there. I'm gonna go into the information tab and click on it. Okay, so this is 0.1 inches over. I wanna make sure this one is a uh, multiple of one tenth. This header is 0.1 inches over. This header is one inch over. So that's a difference of 0.9. So that will line up on a breadboard. So I wanna make something that if I plug it into a breadboard, it'll fit. I'll put these four resistors on the sides like this. Then I can put these capacitors in the middle. And I'm basically gonna start, you know, making this as compact as possible. Yeah, see, we can save a lot of space. Okay, I think I have my basic components ready. I'm going to start drawing all of the traces that will connect everything together. I've arranged everything on the PCB and made it very compact, as well as making all of the connections and vias. We have a final size of just under an inch wide by an inch and three eighths tall. So that's going to be pretty small. I actually printed a paper pattern of it, just so I can get an idea of the size. It's even two-sided, yeah. It's always a good idea to print paper patterns. Paper is pretty cheap and it helps you understand if everything's gonna fit. And I can actually place the components on this paper pattern to make sure that the pads are correct as well. It's never, never a bad idea to double check things like that. So again, this is a two-sided board. Most everything is on the top. On the bottom of the unit, we have the power regulator, the crystal, and the two caps for the crystal. So most everything's on top, but there are a few things on the bottom just to make the space more efficient. Now I'm going to create some CAM files. So this is where you take your Eagle files and turn them into standard Gerber files that you can send into a board house. So I make sure that I have everything that I want here. I should have everything. I'm going to process it. That doesn't take too long. Let's take a look at that. Uh, oh, okay, so I've created a bunch of files here. Okay, here's an online Gerber file viewer. So what I can do is I can go in and check all of these. Let's take a look. Okay, so that's actually copper bottom. That's gonna be the bottom of it, obviously. All right, I wanna make sure everything looks good. It does. The big thing I'm gonna to wanna to check is the uh, silk screen because a lot of times there could be errors with the silk screen and you might not realize it. Okay, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that all our text is correct. Um, sometimes the text might look okay in Eagle, but what is exported as the Gerber file may not be right. So you should always check every Gerber file before you send them off to get made. Uh, this looks pretty good. Everything looks like it lined up well. Okay, I'm happy with that. So what you wanna do uh, when you send these off is usually you wanna make a zip file. And you know, I'm gonna call these like pick 32 heck and then uh, just copy all the files. You don't want the board and schematic or you don't need it, so I'm just gonna get everything but that. Uh, sometimes the Gerber files might not end up where you want them to be, but a good thing to do is just see what files were all created at the same time. In this case, these were all created a few minutes ago and just export those. Let's put them in here. All right, now we have our zip file that we can send away to a board house. I'm going to use Element 14 partner Pentalogix to order some quick turn PCBs. Let's get a quote. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'll just call this PIC32 dev revision one, board length one inch, board, oh wait, inch and three, seven, five, board width. Okay, silk screen only on the top. The point of a quick turn PCB service is you can get boards made in like two or three days. So if you need something done, that's a good choice. The quotes have loaded from Pentalogix. So basically the faster you want the boards, the more they're gonna cost, or if you're okay with them being slower, they're a lot cheaper. Although seven days is still pretty fast compared to most solutions. So I'm gonna go with uh, seven days at $18 each. I think I could live with that. And then up here, uh, we basically choose the zip file that has all the Gerbers in it. 
and now we can add it to our cart. We might even get the boards faster than seven days because they're only two layers. The boards came in, and faster than the quote said they would. It only took about three days because they were two-sided. Nice. All right, I'm going to stuff these in two different ways. I'll do it by hand, and I'll also do it using a reflow oven. Uh, I have some solder paste here. I got this from E14, of course. The crystal, we pretty much have to do with heat because it's really hard to get at the pads in order to try to solder it manually. You don't actually need a reflow oven. You can use a heat gun, which is what I'm gonna do here. So I'm just going to put some paste on all those connections. I'm gonna place my eight megahertz crystal. I'm using this type of crystal because it's just a lot smaller than a uh, standard crystal would be. It's kinda like a cell phone crystal. Well, heck, they make crystals a lot smaller than this. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the heat gun to reflow the crystal part of this. The rest I can do by hand. Awesome, the solder paste pulled everything into position. We would have had trouble trying to solder that uh, crystal because, you know, we can't really get under it to melt the pads. So, you know, using some paste and a heat gun was a good choice. What else do we have here? Oh, we have our much larger than it needs to be 3.3 volt regulator. Again, you know, I was using parts that I had in stock, bird in the hand, two in the bush sort of thing. Hey, Max, if you get upset, does that make you a Mad Max? Yes, definitely. I knew it. All right. So when I'm doing a chip like this, this isn't really that, I don't consider this that bad of a chip to solder. I've done worse. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tin opposite corners of where the chip's gonna land. And then I'm gonna place it, making sure that the orientation is correct. <clears throat> the circle's in the upper left. So we put one corner down. Now I'm gonna put the other corner down. Now that the two corners are soldered, everything else will stay lined up. So now I'm going to do a flood. That is, I'm gonna add way too much solder and then wick up the excess. Because if you go in and try to like solder these pins one by one, you're just gonna drive yourself nuts, mad with insanity. I'm gonna do the flood. I'm gonna push down the chip a little bit just make sure the pads are touching. Now, one very useful thing to have in your arsenal is solder wick. I like this Loctite brand. Yes, the same people who make, wait, this is not Loctite, this is Prime Lock, fake Loctite. Still has that great taste. <laughs> anyway, solder wick is like a mesh copper with some flux in it and it's really good for pulling up solder. So I flood it and then I just wick up the excess using the solder wick. Wick, wick up, it makes all sense now. With the microcontroller attached, it's time to move on to the other components. Uh, one thing you have to watch out for when you're doing surface mount by hand is tombstoning your favorite movie. Well, by that I mean if you attach a part, it will stand up on end because the solder will wick it up. So what I like to do is I like to um, put solder on one of the pads and then put it in place the way you want it, like that, and then solder the other side. That just seems to work out the best for me. Let me see if I can get, get one to uh, tombstone on camera. Okay, it's not tombstone. So this is what tombstoning looks like when it goes Boop. So sometimes that'll happen, the solder will pull it up and make it tombstone, so it's just important that you make sure you keep a little bit of pressure on it so it stays down. And so in these cases, I can put one down, then I'll put another one down. I'll just go through the line soldering one side of each component, and then once they're all in place, I'll go back and solder the other sides. But yeah, I always add a little pressure just to make sure it stays down. So now that they're both in place, 
I can solder the other side. As far as doing this versus the wave oven, it just depends on how much you have to solder. Uh, something small like this, you know, I think it's just as fast to do it by hand. Larger things or things that have more components, you're probably better off using a wave oven. Oh, something else, um, when you put down the first uh, blob of solder, if you're right-handed, put it on the right, and vice versa. See, it's a lot easier for me to hold this with my left hand solder it with my right hand on the right hand side, then it would be to flip it around. So I always kind of solder from the right to the left because I'm right-handed. Max, aren't you left-handed? I am, yeah. Oh, weird. I write with my left hand and throw with my right hand. You know, that's weird because when I used to, like when I was a kid and I would play baseball, I would bat left-handed and I golf left-handed. All right, we're almost done. I have a nice Eagle footprint for this particular mini USB. So I use this mini USB and everything since I know it'll work. There's a great value in just knowing something will work. It's just one less thing you have to think about. My God, Jim, why are you having me rewire this missile? Bones, yeah. A completely useless character now. I don't care what happens to you. So Christopher Waltz is like, I'm not playing Blowfield in the new James Bond movie. And of course he is. <laughs> I hate when they try to even like say that. Yeah. We all learn better from, I am John Harrison. God, this oh, movie sucked. All done. Now we'll do a solder paste version. I used my solder paste to attach the first few parts on the back and they should stay in place pretty well as I do this. You can do homegrown double-sided soldering. So I'm just gonna apply paste along the length of where the pins will be. We may have to clean it up afterwards. I am the human pick and place machine. I am the Terminator Genesis. Give me Genesis. How could he give him Genesis? Genesis missile was blown up. Klingon bastards, you killed my son! All the parts are pasted in place, time to reflow. We built this reflow oven many episodes ago and we still use it. Now we just wait while the oven reflows the solder. We need to do a little touch up work on this. I just need to wick up a little bit of the solder from the pick. It's because I just kind of haphazardly smeared it on. I didn't use a stencil or anything fancy like that. The pick looks nice and clean. I think I'm gonna add a little bit of solder to the USB just to make sure that it took. I normally do through hole things like the USB afterwards, after the reflow oven. But I just thought I'd give it a shot this time. Now it's time to flash the bootloader onto the PIC32. A bootloader is a small program at the beginning of memory in a microcontroller that allows it to be easily programmed. So we have to program it uneasily to make that happen, if that makes any sense. So we're gonna use the Microchip PIC Kit 3 programmer. It's gonna plug in right there. And I used a staggered header. See how they're not quite level? That's so you can plug into it and there's friction, you don't need to solder it. So we're gonna power the microcontroller for starters, and then we're going to plug the pick kit into it. And this will give us both things that we need for programming. Because the pick kit will sense what the power level is on the device, but it won't actually provide power to it. This program is part of MPLAB X and it allows us to actually flash the chip. I'm gonna connect and that should find both the pick kit and the target device being the pick 32 Let's see if it works. All right, uh, apparently it did. All right, so we're gonna get the bootloader, which can be a hex file, and we're gonna hit program. Hopefully it works. Okay, apparently it worked, that's good. So to test, I'm gonna unplug this, the pick kit programmer and the header, because we don't need it. I'm gonna go to devices and printers and then plug back in our dev board, it should show up. 
There it is, right there. Cool. I'm gonna flash the other one that we soldered and then we'll move on to the next step. It's time for a test. We're using MPIDE, which is an Arduino fork that is meant for PIC32 microcontrollers. And it's a little different than using a lot of these boards because there's no uh, FTDI chip, so we actually have to hold down program and reset, and then release reset, and that will cause it to start up in program mode. So now that we have it in program mode, we can go to board, and it's a Fuberino Mini, serial port 22, okay. Let's flash it. And then we should get these lights blinking at different speeds. It's just kind of a hello world sort of test. There they go. Cool. Okay, the lights are blinking. It looks like our dev board is ready to rock. In today's episode, we went over the steps required to make your own dev board. We started by choosing an MCU, in this case, the PIC32. We decided on a form factor, a small PCB that had the proper spacing to fit into any breadboard. We drew a schematic, specifically one based off parts that we already knew worked. We designed and ordered PCBs from a quick turn house. We stuffed components onto the PCB, and then we did that by hand soldering and using solder paste in a reflow oven. Finally, we tested the board to make sure it worked. Now there's a lot of development boards on the market, but sometimes you wanna make your own custom solution that's right for you. Maybe you don't need certain features, maybe you want extra features. Well, making your own dev board is a way to do that. That's all the time we have for today. You can keep track of all of our upcoming builds, events, and episodes on the Element 14 community. We'll see you next time. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Oh God! <laughs> That's a utility belt, not a money belt. Never leave the cave without it. Gordon Ramsay is a professional chef who clearly smokes ten packs a day, but will never show that. Makes it sound like that guy from Storage Board. He's like, this locker is going to have treasure inside. <laughs> oh wait, I don't want everyone to see my bookmarks. You know, they might see like my uh, sloth cosplay bookmarks. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.